Neversoft will always be known for the Tony Hawk's Pro Skater franchise, which became one of the most recognizable in the 2000s, thanks to its revolutionary gameplay and capitalizing on the action sport craze. It became such a hit that there was a new game every year spanning between three console generations, with some of the titles being among my all-time favorites that I still regularly play to this day. But by the mid-2000s, with the studio 10 years old, the developers grew tired of basically making the same thing for 6 of those years, feeling as though the series had run its course by that point. So they wanted to try something new, their first original IP since Apocalypse but also not wanting another studio to take over what is essentially their baby. Neversoft split the development team in half, and the first thing they teased was simply a mature action-adventure title. Vague, but enough indication that it was something completely different. Only crystal clear when still images were released at E3 in 2005. The developers decided on a western because the genre was rising in popularity at the time, and in Neversoft founder Joel Jewett's words, they wanted something more sophisticated and edgy. So they brought in Randall Johnson, who had directed and written films, TV shows, and music videos, but this was his first attempt at writing a video game. He discovered that the difference between games and anything else he had written, with the latter, all you could see is what the camera and director wanted you to see without any control from the audience. But with games, you are in control, with more things to keep you distracted like side missions and character interactions. But unless you're Hideo Kojima, he also learned that game cutscenes had to be short and concise. Though it's something I'd never do, Joel believed players a lot of the time remained completely interested in the gameplay, and told Randall Johnson that the X button on the PlayStation controller was his enemy. A metaphoric way of saying the story had to be well written enough that players didn't want to skip the cutscenes. Montana, 1880. My name is Colton White. My father and I hunt game for the steamboat to travel on the Missouri. Not a bad living if you can stand your old man kicking you every morning at dawn. <coughs> Bite some jerky and collect your gear. Time to earn our pay. Colton White and his father Ned are out hunting, nearly getting themselves killed by a grizzly bear. Then they hop on a steamboat with Ned asking something about the item. Then suddenly... No! The boat is ambushed by Josiah Reed and his henchmen. Barely able to survive, Ned tells Cole to head to Dodge City, and just before the steamboat explodes... I ain't your father! Now go! And with only one lead to go with, Cole rides into different towns in the Old West to investigate and find out who attacked the boat and their whereabouts. To avoid spoiling the plot even more, the attack was instigated by Thomas Magruder, who was interested in a holy cross, a key to an ancient lost city of gold that he'd been trying to find since the American Civil War. Becoming a ruthless railway businessman 15 years later, taking over the land in order to reach his goal. And at some point after the war, Magruder's actions caused others to defect and form a a resistance group to stop in. He's taken over the territory. Us and the Apaches are the only ones fighting back. Count me in too. With Cole in the middle of it all, he aligns himself with the resistance, the Native Americans, and a safe cracker in a race to find the cross before Magruder and avenge his father. Ah, oh, wanna get Magruder, do ya? And every bastard on his payroll. So this is the part of the game that never saw put the highest priority in, depending on a Hollywood screenplay writer to make everything work, along with a lot of Hollywood acting, including Thomas Jane, Chris Christopherson, Tom Skerritt, Lance Hendrickson, Ron Perlman, and Brad Dorff. Neversoft must be huge fans of the Alien franchise. Most of them are entertaining, even though Cole is a little too generic of a protagonist. Easy for you to say. But everyone else he interacts with more than makes up for it. Though I think Dorff as Reverend Reed with his over-the-top dialogue steals the show. Truly the Lord has blessed you with the talent of a marksman. I do all right, preacher. I feel as though the guy he's working for, Magruder, he doesn't appear enough to make a similar impression. Those traitors can't be trusted. You lost it. You go get it back. Now go. Then again, if it's Lance Hendrickson, that's immediately good enough for me. The actors in this game believed the media was reaching proper cinematic levels that match with good films. Gone certainly wasn't the earliest example, but a good showcase of that generation with the way it presents itself. It just looks, acts, and sounds better to watch than something like Red Dead Revolver, where the initial premise was a success of the gun smoke before Rockstar bought the rights from Capcom. And you were playing different characters, so it was pretty difficult to understand what was going on. 
In Gun, there are a lot of cutscenes, like one every couple of minutes of gameplay, yet it didn't feel annoying. I wanted to know what happened next. Goddamn reprobates have no respect for law and order. Although there was some controversy over the portrayal of Native Americans in this game, specifically the intro, which looks like Moan Tomahawk if it were given a $100 million budget, and the mission where you're basically killing them all to clear a path to another portion of the map. God damn it, the devil won't give up! The Association for American Indian Development declared a boycott on Gun, asking for the game to be recalled if they didn't fix the earlier sections. With Activision responding by apologizing for any offense they caused and called the game a reflection of the harshness of America of the 1880s. In this lago na since said na di tin beka. Now I've set many free. Though later on throughout the game, the Apaches play an important role, but that's all I'll say to avoid spoiling the plot. Gun does a half decent job of keeping us second guessing the first playthrough, even if it comes to its conclusions and revelations too quickly since it's such a short game. Normally I go through the backstory for context, but there's a flashback cutscene every few chapters. All you need to know is that Cole is in Montana and pushing forward with whatever clues available to him, like a sheriff without a badge. Whatever's in that safe means more to Magruder than life itself. If I can get to it first, maybe I can finish what Ned started. Joel Jewett insisted that Montana play a role in the story and map design because he wanted a location that had rarely been explored in the media, with its steep elevations and diverse scenery. Oh, and he was from Montana as well. It's easy to forget how beautiful certain parts of America are, especially if you live there. Oh, and seeing as you're new to Dodge, thought I'd better warn you about the locals. Dodge can be a pretty rough place, so if you're gonna start a fight, be prepared to finish it. Writer Randall Johnson also had a fascination for abandoned ghost towns and the dangers when visiting some of them. There was one he went to in Arizona. While browsing around an old schoolhouse, he was swatting at what he thought were bugs, which turned out to be live bullets, and left immediately. Of course, you don't get that sense playing this game, but point is, the environment tries to be diverse with all scenery types that western genre is known for, not just Montana, but multiple states in America, and is complemented with a brilliant soundtrack. It uses a lot of the same songs, or at least they sound the same, but it's probably my favourite part of the whole game. Though when you look at Christopher Leonard's resume, it's not very surprising. So much for your name. However, having played a lot of open world games over the years and seeing the genre of Evolve, particularly the ones I've reviewed recently famed for their map sizes. The one in Gun is a lot smaller than I was expecting. It feels very compressed, like when you explore between towns and parts of the map, the environment completely changes in a matter of seconds, sometimes just over the cliffs. You go from hunting forests straight to desert, which I assume was a trick to remove loading times. Reminds me of Jack and Daxter, the precursor legacy with the way it shifts between different areas seamlessly. I don't know whether that's true or not since I'm using the Xbox 360 version for this review, which means the loading times between gameplay and cutscenes are quick. Handy because there are a lot of them. And you also get a full HD resolution, which I assume you can get on the PC version today. It looks sharp, but I feel as though with some games they benefit more from being played on consoles from certain generations because in some ways the 360 version magnifies the empty and small look of the map a little more. There are only two settlements and in the very rare buildings that have interiors they feel very large and open, like being in a weird dream or something. Or maybe it's because Neversoft is so used to making open levels because of the Tony Hawk games. That's the thing when you review so many open world sandbox games, you notice how different developers approach it with their own style. And you've explored the whole thing after an hour of gameplay. It's easy to accidentally run into spots that blatantly look like story-based level designs, say if you're finding gold hidden all over the map. I suppose it can be a positive in the sense there's a higher volume of gunplay throughout the story. I remember criticizing the first Red Dead Redemption where a lot of the story missions had way too much horse riding, and the less said about the true crime titles, the better. But what I'm saying is Gun might as well be a linear game. In fact, there are points where after you complete a mission, you're stuck in the one spot until you complete the next one straight after that, and there's one moment in the story where you have to go into hiding from a town, yet straight after the mission, you can go back like nothing happened. I don't know if Gun counts as a sandbox GTA styled open world western, it feels closer to an interactive menu selection, especially if you can literally go to the game's map in the menu and select the mission marker if you don't want to travel to it. There's no natural progression when playing this game, and I think the reason it went for the format it has is because it was the craze at the time.
All that said though, there are other things to do outside of the story. The sort of activities that were popular during the American frontier, including poker, rancher, pony express, hunting, wanted posters, and sheriff duty. And when you compare these to the earlier GTA titles, and I'll also bring up True Crime since both are Activision published open world games, when saying it out loud, all you did in those outside for rampaging were emergency runs, hidden items, half-hearted street races, and rampage tokens. And in Gun, the activities feel a little more developed in comparison. Rancher, for example is worth playing just to hear the music and I like the facial expressions when playing Texas style poker. Although they do feel highly repetitive after you finish the story since there's no narrative to generate interest and the fun factor is only barely maintained when you're trying to complete these as quickly as possible. Son of a bitch brain me. The one I hate the most is Pony Express, where it's basically a checkpoint styled horse sprint, because based on the amount of time you have available, you have to be perfect. It also doesn't help when you have enemies trying to stop you, because the way the horse controls work, kicking it into speed reduces its health as well, so you don't want to do it too many times either. And when you combine that with enemies shooting at you, it's tricky to balance both these things to reach your destination, especially if you want to avoid waiting for the clock to wind down since there's no restart from checkpoint in the menu. Otherwise, the horse controls are okay. I always kept forgetting there was a trample button to kill enemies, say, if you have no ammo left, and you're able to shoot while riding. Perfectly self-explanatory. Yeah. <laughs> I also recognize those horse sound effects from the first Age of Empires game. Completing missions and side tasks earn you stats and money, which you can use to purchase upgrades for weapons, horses, and health. With what's available, there's certainly more debt than not having it at all, but... It makes the game feel more like, I'll be kind, an action RPG prototype than a true open world immersion. If there's one thing this game is lacking, it's customization options. Like you think for Neversoft, who have proven they're really good at this sort of thing, this was a missed opportunity in Gun. Colton does change his outfit every once in a while, but it's noticeably rare and inconsistent. One moment he's wearing a full Native American outfit, and the second the mission is complete, he's back in his normal outfit. It's a personal matter. Hmm, I see. And with the stats and upgrades available, there was only one mission where I felt as though I needed to improve to have a chance. This one specifically because the rifle I was given, the reloading times were just the worst. Aside from that, and I suppose the final boss, Magruder, where you have to be surprisingly strategic to inflict damage on him, the whole game is easy. Hit detection is usually generous, especially when the crossfire goes red, ammo and checkpoints are everywhere, and if you keep a dead eye on your health, it'll never run out since you have four chances to refill it before it actually runs out. I'm playing this game on the normal difficulty, that could be why it's so easy. I replayed Red Dead Revolver for this review to see if there were any similarities, at least control-wise, and there certainly were. The weapon selection, the way the game lightly auto-aims at an enemy, and the quick draw, a particularly handy mechanic in your arsenal. It's almost identical to Red Dead Revolver, and it was simply a matter of figuring out the button input since I'm using an Xbox 360 controller. I found myself accidentally pressing the crouch button too many times for the first hour, because out of instinct, the LB or L1 button is normally used to zoom a weapon in most shooters. Ned never cared much for six guns. Rifle and tomahawk were his choosing. The only thing unique about the controls is the use of TNT barrels since there are moments when you need to pick them up and place them in certain positions to either advance through a level by force or take out multiple enemies even though you have throwable dynamite and whiskey bombs. I didn't depend on this because there's no strategy into throwing them and the weapons are almost always good enough to do the job anyway. Hurry it up Cole, I see him coming. Hell of a shot kid, bet he was dead before he hit the ground. <sighs> You gonna arrest me? I wish you didn't end a mission in the middle of nowhere. In fact, after completing a mission and you save your progress, of course, no matter how many times you save it before the next story mission, it'll always reload right at that spot where you completed your last story mission, sometimes in the middle of nowhere. It might sound like a minor nitpick, and as I mentioned before, checkpoints are generous throughout, and you can even save your progress in the middle of a story mission, which is rare in the open world genre. Particularly handy when you have little time in your life, it's something almost all video games should have. 
but by the time I finished the story, it spawned me at the location of the final mission every time I boot up the game. Like, there's no designated safe house or point of interest or anything like that. And this is what kept bothering me about Gun. The fact that it was made in such a short amount of time. When I reviewed Need for Speed Undercover, I know these are two completely different games, but what they do have in common is these were made in such a short amount of time, and by a development team that were divided. So all Neversoft could do was recycle whatever resources they developed from making the Tony Hawk games and turn it into something different. Here's an open world game that plays competently, there's nothing broken or unfair, if anything it's a little too easy. It's a western setting with characters you care about and a fantastic soundtrack. Yet, I completed it without any real motivation to 100% it or plans to replay it again in the future. It simply feels like a game that took a year or two to make, so that's what you should expect. It's like I could understand what he was saying, but I couldn't quite speak it. I would be more positive towards Gun if I was reviewing it in 2005. I have to understand when it was made, this was an era when it was easy to get away with making the same game once a year. For example, even the GTA series with the 3D Universal never saw themselves making Tony Hawk games in between Gun. It was released on November 2005 on the PlayStation 2, Portable PC, Nintendo GameCube, Xbox, and a launch title for the Xbox 360, less than a month after Tony Hawk's American Wasteland. No way would one game developer make an open world title and something different only a month between each other today. It's kind of impressive they were able to make what they did in that time between two console generations. Today Gun is another one of those games where it's gotten extremely high praise in recent years, that if it weren't for this there would be no Red Dead Redemption, that it should be remade, which seems unwarranted. Like if a remake was in the works, remember who's publishing it. And it would get way too many comparisons to Red Dead Redemption 2, a game that has basically made all future open world titles DOA because of its unbelievable attention to detail which we might not see again for another decade. However, back in 2005, there were plans for Gun to be another franchise to coexist with the Tony Hawk series. Unfortunately, it failed to meet expectations sales-wise, and Activision wanted games, games, games to do well entering the next generation of consoles. You could say their other open-world title, True Crime New York City, was also thrown under the bus for the same reason. Mind you, Gun is a lot better as a video game than this. Like the developers intended, it comes down to whether the story of Gun is good enough to make up for everything else. Like a favorite movie you like to watch more than once. And I don't think it has the same effect. Short answer, only once. But there's not enough replay value after that. So I conclude once again with a take this review and decide for yourself if it's worth buying or not.